Welcome everybody to Ask the Stud 10. Gosh almighty, man. Times are going fast. Uh, can't believe we're on the 10th one of these. Uh, I love these. I always enjoy them. Uh, this one, uh, I'm sure, is going to have some great questions in it. As always, uh, we've got some extremely knowledgeable fans. It's pretty amazing. And uh, I really appreciate everybody's uh, support and uh, you joining us today. This, I think, uh, is going to be... Uh, Another good one, and uh, and actually uh, maybe even better and better than uh, any of them before. So uh, uh, we're ready to go, and uh, let's get right to it. Our first question is from Brian Haas in Texas. With hindsight being twenty twenty, is there anything in the wrestling business you wish you had accomplished, or is there anything you wish you hadn't done? I'm a big fan of the Studcast. Keep up the great work, and God bless. That's a great question. Jeez, uh, uh, I'll give that a little bit of thought there before I jump on that one. Uh, um, uh, I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna talk about the one that uh, that uh, I wish I, I wish I had done, and you know, uh, uh, rather than what I had done, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, talk about something that I wish I had done, and. Uh, I've touched on it before, uh, and uh, in, uh, that was, was 1980, about 1986, I had a company out of Houston, Texas that uh, found out about our Continental Wrestling Show. Don't know how they found out about it, but they got in touch with me, and they 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 loved the program. Uh, they sent some guys out of Houston to, to see the, how it was done, and then... Uh, Three, about three weeks after they made the little visit, they called me up and they said, Ron, uh, uh, we think we can get you on TV in New York, in the NBC. And I was like, whoa, you know, um, and, and uh, you know, there was, at that point, there was no, uh, nobody on uh, any of the three major networks. So, uh, you know, uh, I made a trip, I went to New York City, uh, spent two days up there. I went to the NBC uh, studios uh, and into their big main center and, uh, and I sat down and talked to people uh, about uh, the, what what I would like, what I what I, I would see as uh, being done. And uh, and what the great part about it is uh, we were had that continental show, and that's why those guys really wanted to take me to New York because. We were, I think, the first, and I'm not absolutely sure about this, but I'm sure we're the first or the second company to uh, start to produce the show with a truck out of the studio. We decided to get out of the studio and uh, go and produce into a major arena where the television had six, 8,000 fans there and watching it. And uh, wow, it worked tremendously, even better than I ever anticipated it would. So uh, when the NBC people saw this, uh, they had never seen it before. They had never seen it done that way before. They had always uh, been, uh, th that's why they weren't interested is because they did not want a studio show. And everybody in the country had the studio show. So this was, I think, the first time they ever saw one uh, a wrestling pro program produced great commentator, Gordon Sully. And, uh, and uh, with uh, great matches, a uh, big crowd, uh, a totally different atmosphere than what the uh, normal television programs, wrestling TV programs were back at that time frame. So uh, they uh, I made the trip, I went home, uh, uh, NBC got in touch with me and uh, they said, uh, we'd like to do your show. We'd like to do it. And uh, so, you know, and, and, and I guess this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I, 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 you know, so you ask uh, what I hadn't done, um, and uh, and I wish I, I, what happened is I didn't take the show. I didn't take the opportunity to do it because I felt like that 
I was part of the NWA and I didn't know how all the guys within the NWA were going to accept me being on national television and uh, them just being in their own territories and and uh, whether they were going to get worried about uh, uh, was I going to try to take over and uh, and if I if I had have uh, taken the opportunity I would have done it certainly different than the guy that did come along and got the opportunity and was Vince McMahon Jr. And, uh, you know, obviously we all know the end of that story and how that all turned out. Uh, he took over all the territories and uh, and uh, his greed was uh, uh, just to have, a, have everything and own it all. And uh, that's exactly uh, what he did. Put everybody out of business. Uh, if I had have taken that opportunity that was offered at, offered to me, uh, I think uh, wrestling would be totally different today than what it is. Uh, I believe I could have uh, worked with the guys within the National Wrestling Alliance. I could have, instead of just promoting my talent in my territory, I could have promoted the NWA. As the, as the greatest wrestling organization on earth at that time, and which they really were. Uh, and and uh, I believe, uh, you know, I could have had everybody want to cooperate with me. I could have set up a schedule to where I was going to take uh, maybe, a, if I had a four-match program, I was going to take two matches from the other territories. And uh, just to... Uh, and then highlight the NWA, how good the talent was within the National Wrestling Alliance as compared to uh, New York's territory at that time and, uh, and all the other independent territories at that time. So uh, uh, Mr. Hoss, I think it was, uh, out of Texas, uh, that's my answer. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't have anything that, that, you know, that really hits me right now about the things that I would have loved that I accomplished. But uh, this is something I didn't do that I really regret. And uh, it affected all of us. Uh, it affected my family. It affected uh, lots of families, uh, the, the Funks and the, uh, the Grams and a uh, uh, lot of different territories that, uh, that all went under. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we know what happened in this. When Vince got a hold of this, uh, he just used it to build Vince and to make Vince the king. And uh, that's what it turned out to be. So, uh, great question. Great question. Um, uh, uh, great question. And uh, appreciate the comment. Nice comment about enjoying the state cast. And, uh, and uh, thank you very much. And uh, I love your state. Uh, I love to go to Texas. Our next question is from Todd Flynn, Cerebral, Tennessee. I saw in an old wrestling program where you came back to Knoxville and wrestled in 1981 for Black Jack Mulligan. Could you tell us what that was about? Oh, wow. Todd, uh, uh, yeah, um, in order to kind of get this uh, so that everybody would understand what's going on, I'm going to back up a little bit to where I sold the territory in 1979, and I sold the territory to Jim Barnett and uh, Fred Ward, who was another Georgia promoter uh, who had Columbus and uh, Macon, Georgia, and a bunch of little smaller Georgia towns. And uh, so the Barnett and... and, and uh, <laughs> Barnett and his partner, they didn't they didn't have a great uh, success in Knoxville after we had left, and and I kind of anticipated that. I talked to my partners when when we all went to Pensacola, and uh, decided just to run one territory that I felt like that we had done such a great job there, getting ourselves over and been there for so long that I didn't think anybody was going to be able to follow us. Uh, and, uh, you know, Jim Barnett had great talent, uh, and he was right there in the Atlanta Territory, and uh, he was going up into Columbus, Ohio. He had WTBS TV at that time, which was on a satellite being shown around the world. Uh, 
And you would have thought he would have been able to go in there and just boom, uh, kick it right up to where, where it had been, filling up the Coliseum. But it didn't happen for him. So he sold the business, Knoxville and Southeastern, to, uh, to Blackjack Mulligan and Ric Flair. Um, then uh, they, they didn't have any success either. They were having a very, very difficult time in drawing anything. They, and they weren't making money for sure. And uh, I think they were probably losing money. And I got a call from Black Jack Mulligan that, that asked me, he said, Ron, would you come up and work a match for us? It was in the summertime. They were wrestling in the old amphitheater. And uh, and I said, uh, you know, why wouldn't I? You know, really, and, you know, I, I kind of wanted to go home to Knoxville and, you know, uh, wrestle up there again. It was, and, you know, I said, who am I going to work with? He said, the Mongolian Stomper, and he's going to be, he's being managed by Don Carson. And I was like, wow, that's the old guys that I used to work with, you know. So uh, so that's kind of taught how I, how I got to into the situation and how I ended up in Knoxville in 1981. It's the only time I went back to wrestle until I went back there with my own company, Continental, in 1985. But I did go there that night, and, uh, and what was really strange is I, I got, it, I, I, it was a totally different atmosphere. And I always tell the story and, uh, that, uh, to me, the atmosphere of your dressing room was critical to how your business was doing. And uh, that I remember when we ran in that old amphitheater and we had those dressing rooms that were connected there. And uh, it was like a, it was like a party. I mean, the guys were just so happy and they were going back and forth from dressing room to dressing room. and. Uh, Everybody was upbeat, and uh, and you when you opened the door, there was a door there that you could open and see the crowd in the amphitheater, and those that amphitheater would be packed, man. It'd be five, six, uh, more than six thousand people it would hold, and it was just rocking back in those days. And uh, when I went there, the first thing I noticed is nobody talked to each other. You know, uh, and me and me and uh, Stomper and, and Carson, we had a pretty lively conversation because it was just common that, you know, I felt like, well, hey, this is, you know, I, I make it like it's like in the old days. But everybody else was sitting off in corners and nobody talking to each other. And uh, and there was no blackjack. I was like, after after about 30 or 45 minutes, I said, where's, where's Muppet? And they said, he's in that very back dressing room back there. He don't ever come out. He just goes in there. That's when he gets here. He goes there. He stays there. And uh, he gives us a finish. And, and then uh, he comes out for his match. And I was like, wow. You know, I mean, I, that wasn't the way I ran business. So, uh, you know, that was very strange to me. Anyway, uh, they had been drawing nothing. Uh, they were drawing... Uh, 2,000, 1,500 to 2,000 people in that amphitheater where we were drawing 6,000. And uh, so that night, the amphitheater was about uh, three quarters full. And I remember uh, Don and uh, Stomper, they took a look outside. And every, that was every wrestler wanted to see what the house looked like. And they came right back to me and they go, Ron, they go, wow. This place is, we got twice what we've been drawing here, man, because uh, it had to be because you're on the card, you know. I mean, uh, you and Stomper and me, you know, we, the, the fans still remember, obviously, the old days. And, and obviously, they would like to see it again, right? So, uh, and, uh, and I think they had a good point, uh, you know, uh, and it was kind of like I told my partners when we end up going to, to, down to Pensacola that I don't think anybody's going to be able to follow us there. And that turned out to be the case. Uh, there was no wrestling then. Uh, uh, Mulligan, once Mulligan and Flair dropped out of it, there was no wrestling at all in Knoxville, for, uh, except for a guy named Terry Landell who ran these little shows uh, while in parking lots of uh, 
Walmarts and things like that. I mean, he didn't, he, it was no wrestling really. And it was none until we came back in 1985, brought Continental in there, got on TV again and brought Continental back. And, uh, and that, that territory was, had a reputation of being dead. Knoxville territory is dead and nobody can make a draw. And uh, when we came back in 1985, first show we came there, we booked in the Coliseum. Uh, we turned away almost as many people as we put in the Coliseum. I mean, it was like a homecoming, man. It was, and the building was just, it was exactly like it was when we left there in uh, 1979. So, um, great question, uh, Todd, great question. And uh, that's kind of what happened. And uh, wow, uh, it was a different day and time, man. Uh, 1981, uh, uh, those guys were struggling. Uh, Barnett had struggled, and uh, Blackjack and uh, Flair, they struggled. Great cards, great talent. Just people just didn't want to see it. And uh, strange deal, but uh, that's, that's the story. Our next question is from Craig Brinkley, Bristol, Florida. Has Hulk ever thanked you for what you did for him? Craig, uh, uh, well, he, he thanked me in the strangest of ways, I guess you would say. I mean, uh, I don't uh, recall him uh, ever coming in and saying, Ron, uh, thank you very much for, for bringing me in here and giving me the opportunity and that type of thing. But I do remember that I worked with him several times in the uh, Pensacola Territory down in the Gulf Coast, 1979, when he was breaking in. Uh, and I went and did a lot of jobs for him, uh, and, I, and I tried to help him learn how to work uh, as much as I possibly could. And then in, later in 1979, uh, Thanksgiving night to be exact, in uh, 1979, uh, I was the last guy to leave uh, Knoxville and go south to the, to the Gulf Coast Territory. Uh, I had sold the territory to Barnett and uh, and on that Thanksgiving card, I wrestled Sterling Golden, who was the Hulk. Um, and uh, I remember that uh, I, that the, the Booker, I think the Booker was still Dick Slater, who was had been my Booker in 1979 before I sold out to Barnett. Barnett wanted to keep uh, Dick Slater, uh, Paul Orndorff, Fox Baker, and and the angel Frank Morrell out of the out of my crew that I had when when we were making the deal to sell Knoxville, so uh, uh, he made Dick Slater his booker. Barnett just kept Dick as his booker, and Dick came in and he told us to finish. And he and in the finish, uh, he wanted to uh, he wanted to beat me, and uh, and I didn't care. I was leaving there. It was the last time I was going to wrestle in Knoxville for until 1981. To the, the question I think I just answered, you know, and I, that would be the only time I was going to wrestle there for six years until 1985. So, uh, so, and when Slater left the dressing room, uh, and I think uh, the Hulk was their champion, the Southeastern champion. He had just won that belt. And uh, and uh, once uh, Dick left, and uh, you know, we sat and uh, we started to talk about the match and things we might do. And he says, uh, "Ron, he goes, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to beat you." He says, uh, "This is your town. This is your territory. That you were a star here." And he goes, uh, "He goes, I'm, I'm going to New York." He said, "They don't even know." But I've already made a deal, and I'm, I'm going to New York in about three weeks. Well, he was jumping around from everywhere when he got started. He came to me, he went to Memphis, he went to Georgia. Now he's headed to New York. And he says, uh, I don't I don't want to beat you. And, uh, and <laughs> I said, well, wait, you know, I mean, I, I don't mind doing the job. It's, 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 it's part of the business. And he says, no, no. He goes, uh. You know, uh, he, he says, maybe it's my way of thinking, thanking you, Ron. 
you know, uh, uh, I just don't feel good about going out there and beating you in this town with all the things that you accomplished here. And so, you know, I said, well, uh, if you feel that way. Uh, so we worked out a little finish that, uh, that he didn't beat me in the middle. You know, that was what they were going to do is beat me in the middle because they knew, didn't know he was going to New York. He's their champion. And uh, so, you know, they wanted to get him over. I was certainly willing to do the job for him. But, uh, wow. And in a way, man, uh, that's the biggest thank I think I ever got from a wrestler. You know, I mean, it just showed uh, his respect for me. Uh, and for what I had done in that particular town. I think if that had been Atlanta that we were in or any other city other than Knoxville, that uh, he would have gone ahead and done exactly what they wanted him to do. And I'm sure I never asked him afterward uh, that he got some heat. I'm sure, you know, they came to him, Dick must have come and said, hey, what's the deal, man? You didn't do the, 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 the finish. And uh, so I don't know how he explained all that. That's the last time I ever saw the Hulk was uh, in that, that night after that match. And uh, I thanked him at the end of the match, which was customary. You went and looked your guy up and you thanked him very much for the match. And, uh, and uh, I never saw him after that where I could speak to him again. Our next question is from Mark Cole, Newark, Delaware. Do you miss owning a hockey team? That's crazy, uh, you know, and I think the first question that we did uh, in this one was from a guy named Hoss in, uh, in Texas out there. And, uh, you know, when I started thinking about what I had accomplished, I think he asked him what I regretted or what I didn't accomplish, uh, didn't do in wrestling. That I, uh, I got this thought that came instantly to my mind with that question and... Uh, but uh, I didn't, I didn't want to, because it wasn't the, the subject of wrestling that I kind of uh, decided to go ahead and talk about uh, the getting, turning down the chance to be on a national television hookup with a, with a wrestling show. And uh, so, uh, strangely enough, I think in my mind, uh, um, you talk about, uh, do I miss owning a hockey team? I think I'm gonna I'm gonna answer the rest of Hoss's question uh, out there in Texas. Uh, I think my greatest accomplishment didn't come in wrestling. I think my greatest accomplishment came in hockey, and uh, and I got a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one of them is uh, as far as minor league hockey, no one, no one, I don't believe ever to this day, ever drew the attendances that uh, me and my partners drew in hockey, in Nashville and in Cincinnati, particularly Cincinnati, because drawing uh, 10,000, we were beating, uh, we beat four NHL teams in attendance and with a minor league team in Cincinnati, Ohio. It was like the talk of hockey. I mean, people were going crazy and, uh, and there, there was a reason for it. I really believe there was a reason that that happened. And the reason it happened is hockey. When, when I saw my first hockey game, it was the most dead thing I ever saw at the beginning of the game. Uh, they didn't announce anything. Uh, they just, the players would come out of the locker room and they would skate around in circles and warm up on the ice. And nobody even said, hey, welcome your team to the ice. I mean, it was like, you know, and and so, and I know it never had any interest in getting involved in hockey had it not uh, had had it not been uh, for a fight. They had a fight in the second period, and the crowd stood up, and everybody got into it, and and then I told my partner, uh, who's Bob Polk, who ended up being a partner in my Continental Wrestling and my USA, and uh, we were partners in both hockey teams. And I told Bob, I said, Bob, I think I can identify with this. Well, then when we got involved and we got a team, 
I sat down with Bob and I said, Bob, we need to do something that's never been done in hockey. You know, I mean, uh, and I said, I can't, I can't send my guys out on the ice and, and, and not do something, something different. Uh, something that's going to start the game in a totally different way. And uh, he said, well, what do you got in mind? And I said, I, so I've been thinking about it, and I laid it out to him. And he's like, he lit up like a Christmas tree. He was like, God, Ron, that'd be unbelievable. He goes, wow, the, you'll have everybody in the building standing up before they drop the puck. And I said, the, well, is that am I gonna? Is this gonna get us any heat? You know, I mean, because uh, I don't think they've ever done anything like this. And he says, "Well, we own the team, don't we? Can we do whatever we want?" And I said, "Yes, sir. We certainly can." So uh, that's what we did on that first hockey game in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, in which everybody, all the press and the, everybody says. Uh, you're not going to draw 500 people. Some of them said, you won't draw 500 people. You know, uh, hockey is not going to be a big thing here in Nashville. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I couldn't I couldn't tell them exactly what we're going to draw, but I said, guys, I think you're way, way off of that figure. We drew 6,000 people that first opening night. That league had never had a team that drew 2,000 people. We drew 6,000 in the very first game. And uh, I remember hiding, and I always like, I never like to get down on the ice. I like to stay back in the corridor in the dark. And I watched that opening that night. Oh, it was absolutely awesome. I mean, when that building went black and they started playing bad to the bone and the, and the spotlights were just roaming all over the ice and, uh, and, uh, the people started standing up in the stands. Uh, they had never introduced either hockey team ever in in in, in, in any team in, in no level of hockey at this point. And uh, so then the other teams lined up on the blue line and uh, and they start bringing out our players and announcing them one by one big announcement here's so and so from New Brunswick, Canada, and uh bang, bang here we come out. And you got the fans now, they're on their feet and they're just roaring, they're cheering all these players. They don't know who they are. They have no idea. It's the first time they've ever seen them. But it was so it was so contagious of what was happening in that building that uh wow, it just it was it, it just, it, I got chill bumps standing back there watching and I go, wow, this is, this is much beyond what I ever dreamed it was going to be. By the time he brought the last kid came out on the ice, they had, all the other players were lined up on the blue line. They were watching this. It was, they, they, they'd never seen this before. They were like looking at each other and like, what are they doing? And the last kid came out, he took his hockey stick, he hit on his knees, he was sliding across the ice, he flipped his hockey stick around and he, he mowed down the old, old opposing team. And that building exploded. It was like the roof came off the building. Uh, I went back to the, uh, I went back as soon as it was over, I went back to the office and I sat in that office alone by myself and I said, wow, th this is, this is, this has got to be unbelievable, you know, for, for hockey people. And strangely enough, there were two guys that came in earlier in the night that had come in from uh, Chicago at the Chicago team. And they said, you know, because I was a wrestler, they wanted to see what I was going to do. And they they were mad. They they came into my office and they, they said, uh, you know, uh, who owns this? And I said, I'm one of the owners here, you know. And I, and I introduced myself, shook their hands, and, uh, you know, and they said, uh, who the hell do you think you are? And I said, what do you mean? And they go, uh, hey, what you did out there on the ice to to start the game. They go, that's not hockey. 
that's not hockey. And I was like, wow, guys, you know, I go, I go, uh, you know, I thought it was unbelievable. I go, uh, how many people did you see sitting down when, when that game, before the game ever started? And have you ever seen that in hockey before, even at your level? And they were like looking at each other. And I, and I said, uh, I bet the two of you were standing up. And they looked at each other again. I could tell right then, yeah, we, we were. We, we stood up like everybody else. You couldn't see if you weren't standing up. So uh, so I think that's, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, do I miss hockey? Yeah, that was your question. I definitely miss hockey, but... Uh, uh, that's that's the second part of your answer to your question, Hoss, that started us all off here. Uh, that, to me, was the greatest accomplishment I ever made in wrestling, in hockey, in, um, in the security business, uh, maybe in my life, because now you don't see anybody in hockey that doesn't do it. They all do it. They all do it. And uh, and all of that came from an idea that the Nashville Knights owners had in Nashville, Tennessee. We're the smallest minor league team in the country that drew $6,000, 6,000 people on their opening night. Our next question is from Gregory Rose, F Valley Community, Pioneer, Tennessee. Who was your best booker, and how was he different from your other bookers? Well, I'll tell you, um, I didn't have a whole lot of bookers, to be honest with you. I guess I ran my own companies, and uh, I had been a wrestler for many, many years. Uh, uh, I had been around some great bookers. I had my own ideas. I was fairly creative, and uh, and I had a brother that uh, was just like me. He was very creative too, and he had his own ideas. And uh, so, uh, my best booker, my best booker, uh, was my brother. Other than myself, I think I was a fairly decent booker myself, uh, you know. But uh, when I first started, uh, before I started actually booking. I had Louis Tillet to book for me a little bit in Knoxville in 1975, my first year with Southeastern there. And uh, he's going to get Bob with me in 1979 and book for me down in the uh, Gulf Coast Territory. Uh, and uh, that's where you're going to get Hulk and uh, some of those other people that uh, came into the business. Uh, they started uh, through Louis Tillet. Uh, I think uh, my brother was a better booker than Louis Tillet. To be honest with you, and, and I think uh, I probably was too. And uh, so uh, we ran the company for all the years that I owned it. Uh, my brother didn't come and wrestle for me until about two years in, and uh, then I made him the booker when he came there. Uh, Louis was there up until that point, and uh, you know, uh, right away, Rob jump business big time I mean you know and he had some talent that Louie couldn't get to come in that Rob was able to get to come in and uh, when you got great wrestlers and you got a pretty decent booker it's a good combination you're going to draw some money so uh, once I sold Southeastern in 1979 because of the Knoxville war and I went down south to Pensacola me and Rob and Bob Armstrong and Jimmy Golden and Roy Lee Welch, uh, the five of us uh, owned that company down there. And wow, we just, once we went there in 1979 uh, and committed to building the Gulf Coast Territory, we exploded it. We just rocked it. We rocked it down there. And uh, so uh, Booker-wise, my brother and I sat down in 1980 uh, when we all got down there, and uh, and I and he said, Ron, uh, he says, uh, I I'd like to book, but I don't want to book every year because I I want to go like a whole year, and then I, and then I want to take some time off and maybe go work another territory. And I said, uh, 
that's a great idea. And, uh, and he said, uh, you know, Ron, he goes, uh, if, when we sit and talk about uh, angles and things that we're going to do, he goes, your ideas are, are tremendous. I mean, he goes, uh, why don't you do the booking one year and I'll do the booking the next year. So we agreed on that. Rob took 1980, I took 1981, he took 1982, I took 1983. We alternated to about 1984. Then we kind of both started working together on the book. 84, 85, once Continental got started, uh, it was a bigger, bigger game, bigger outfit. And uh, so it, it took a little bit more work. But uh, your question about uh, who was the best booker I ever had, uh, you know, I, I think my brother uh, was a great booker. Uh, and uh, Louis Tillette was not a bad booker. He booked in a lot of territories. He booked in Atlanta. He booked in Florida. He, he, he had some experience. But, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, as a team, uh, maybe my brother and I probably were the best thing that we ever had and the best thing we ever did when it came to the bookers. Our next question is from Carl Stern from Alabama. Who was the 1984 Mass Assassin in Southeastern Championship Wrestling? Was it Randy Barber or Bob Owens? I've seen conflicting reports. I've always heard it was Barber, but Ken Timms insisted to me it was Bob Owens. Okay, uh, well, uh, good question. Uh, uh, I'll go back and talk just a little bit about uh, what was going on during that time frame. That's the first time I ever actually put together what I call was my stable of wrestlers. Uh, I had a, I wore a tuxedo and a top hat and I carried a cane. You know, uh, uh, I loved it. It was fun for me. Wow, it was one of the best times ever. And I, and I had some tremendous, tremendous wrestlers that I was, that I had in my stable. I had the Lord Humongous, I had Arn Anderson, I had Jimmy Golden, I had, uh, uh, later on I had the Flame. Uh, I had some uh, Zukov, uh, Russian, uh, uh, just, uh, uh, and then I really, really just loved that time frame. And it was so, well, we had so much heat and so many good heels. Uh, so, uh, and I remember that I had an assassin, um, and, uh, the assassin was Bob Owens. Um, uh, and th th I had this assassin long before I had the flame, uh, and the flame was the actual, one of the actual original assassins. It was Tom Ernesto and Jody Hamilton. Uh, Jody Hamilton was out of Atlanta, a tremendous heel. Wow, one of the greatest heels ever. And uh, I got him to come in later on and, and be a part of my stable. Uh, but I didn't call him the assassin because I had already had uh, Bob Owens come in and, and be the assassin for me, the early assassin in my stud stable. But once uh, Continental got cranked up, I needed a big time, big time assassin. Uh, Jody didn't want to be the assassin because he was so much more uh, impressive than Bob Owens was as the assassin. And, you know, and he, and he said, Ron, uh, I, wanted, I want to be a masked man, but uh, I want a different persona. And I said, well, tell me what you want. And he figured it out and he came to me and he said, I want to call myself the flame. He had a different outfit. Uh, wow, he had a, it was a better gimmick than it, the assassin, I thought. Wow, he was spectacular as the flame. And uh, so so the the quick answer to the question is uh, it was Bob Owens, not, not Randy Barber, but it was Bob Owens that uh, was the assassin for me in the original uh, group of, um, of uh, the stud stable. And uh, then uh, the, the stable just started got better and better. Uh, started in 84. Uh, by 85, uh, we were starting up the Continental TV and making that TV in Birmingham at the building and 8,000 people for your TV shows. And 
well, I just I just kept improving the stable. It just got better and better, 84 up to 85 on into 86. Uh, uh, the stable was, uh, I think it was one of the best gimmicks uh, in wrestling at that time. Uh, and I think uh, it was probably before a whole lot of ones that came along later, the horsemen and the other guys, I think. Uh, probably some of them got the idea from um, seeing what the heck we were doing down there in, uh, in Continental. Our next question is from Bill Ahrens from Muncie Valley, PA. Hey, Stud, seems like you usually ran with a smaller crew of wrestlers on your shows. What do you think is the ideal roster size of wrestlers in your promotions? And how was that changed over the decades going back to your grandfather's early days? Thanks for your awesome studcast. I listen every week. Well, thank you, Mr. Evans. That's a great question. Uh, let's go back to my grandfather's days. Let's just start there and uh, talk about the number of people uh, on a card. And, uh, you know, uh, back in the old days, my grandfather, they would run matches with four wrestlers. Uh, and they would get uh, 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 four falls. So they'd, get, they'd get five falls, uh, like five matches out of a four wrestler card. And the way they would do it is uh, they would have a single match. They would have a single match, uh, one, two guys, on, uh, one guy from each team in the first match, then one guy from each team in the second match, different, different guys. And then they would come back and have a two out of three fall tag match. So, you know, you got five, five falls. You got to see five finishes uh, and with four guys. Uh, and that was done for money. Uh, you know, guys didn't make much money back in those days. Uh, he, he was in the Depression when uh, uh, the payoff was 50 cents sometimes, he told me, you know, and uh, that was a lot of money in the Depression times, uh, you know, strangely enough. And they weren't having inflation problems back in those days. So, uh, uh, anyway, um, so yeah, and, and I started with a small crew. Uh, when I went to Knoxville and ran my first company, I think I had an, about a 12-man crew. Uh, and it, it was about a four-card, four four-match four card with those 12 guys. You had some single matches, and then you had a tag match. One tag match, usually, and the rest of the matches were single matches. As the company grew and the crowds got bigger, I wanted to give fans more, and I bumped that to 14. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, it would come to 15 when you had a manager because the manager got paid too, just like he wrestled. So, um, you know, then you jumped it up there to, uh, to 14 or 15. Uh, you end up with uh, six matches uh, on a card. Uh, that was a big card back in those days for anybody's territory pretty darn good. Uh, on into 1984 and 1985, when we started Continental, uh, we had the big television show. Uh, we were running in major arenas. Uh, we had expanded off away from the Gulf Coast to uh, into Kentucky. Uh, we were uh, we were doing big business. Uh, we went to 16. We went to 16, uh, sometimes uh, 17, uh, sometimes 18 wrestler card. Uh, we would have, uh, there were nights when we would have eight matches, which uh, that was a Madison Square Garden type of card. You know, the garden wasn't doing more than that. Uh, they had maybe eight matches was about as far as the even matches in Madison Square Garden would go to. So, uh, you know, um, it did. Uh, and it uh, it just it all depended on uh, how good your your towns were doing uh, and how good the talent was, uh, uh, but uh, that's that was the progression. Uh, four guys during the thirties and forties and into the fifties, they probably jumped that to six guys, and uh, into the seventies that went to twelve guys and uh, fourteen, and. Uh, and then uh, we took it on up to 17, 18, uh, in uh, 85, 86, uh, 87. 
seven match cards. Uh, that was uh, pretty much uh, how it worked. And, uh, great question, though. Uh, and uh, hopefully I explained it uh, well for you. Our next question is from Ronnie Rice. Love your When Wrestling Was Wrestling series. Regarding the Madison Square Garden one, did working there feel different than other places? If yes, was it the history of the building and the other big names that had been there, or because it was New York City, one of the biggest cities in the world? <laughs> Jeez, great question, but I think it was all of that. All of those things that you just mentioned combined. I mean, uh, you're in the biggest city in the world. You're in one of the most famous buildings in all of history. And not just sports history, history, period. Uh, and, you know, uh, I was, uh, this was in 1973. I was, uh, wow, 20, 25 years old, 26 years old. Uh, you know, uh, just a kid, man, and to be able to uh, wrestle in Madison Square Garden was a, it was an honor and, and certainly a thrill. I mean, you know, it, it was it was the Mecca. It was the Mecca of sports and, the, and certainly the Mecca for, for wrestling as well. So, uh, you know, uh, it was it's a tremendous experience. Uh, I was a young guy. I wish I had, I had a better opponent. Uh, they put me with uh, with uh, the Andre the Giant's um, interpreter and uh, you know, uh, Frank Valois. Uh, it's a little bitty small guy. Uh, I wasn't able to do much because I didn't have much to work with. Uh, but I still had a great match. And, uh, uh, and, and because the Florida Territory was sending their tape into New York uh, to back up... Uh, uh, Vince McMahon Sr.'s uh, uh, television stations. He didn't want to get people on his TV stations who were going to compete with him. And he and Eddie Graham had a great relationship. They sent the Florida tape in there. And when I went in there, because I was on top, I was the uh, I was the Southern Heavyweight Champion in Florida at that point, and the Florida Heavyweight Champion back in those days. And uh, when I went in there, I got as big as a ovation as any of the New York stars. I was like, you know, and I wasn't really aware that uh, that the Florida show was in New York City, and so uh, it was a tremendous experience. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, all those things. You're right about all of them. You it, that was the ultimate for I think any wrestler was to wrestle in that building, uh, and. Uh, what an honor. Our next question is from Rex Alla Master of Jackson, Michigan. Ron, a late June 1984 Southeastern episode mentioned that during a band tournament, the WTBS cameras from Atlanta were coming to the Fairgrounds Arena in Birmingham, Alabama. Not even three weeks later, Black Saturday happened. I got to ask, Dad, were you negotiating to do a talent switch or acquisition of the Georgia office with Ole Anderson? The last part of the question would be, had you guys been able to secure the WTBS time slot, what could Southeastern and Continental have been on the monster WTBS slot instead of McMahon or Crockett? That's a great question from Jackson, Michigan? That's a great question, sir. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't remember uh, making that announcement on the show in uh, 1984, uh, <clears throat> but, I, but I, the rest of it, I, I had no, I had, we were doing good. Our business was very, very strong. Uh, and uh, I certainly wasn't looking to expand, not especially into somebody else's territory. Uh, I know Ole was the booker for of Barnett, and uh, I know that uh, a lot of things were going on over there TV-wise. With WTBS, uh, it had become a, a, a real, uh, well, a trophy. You got on WTBS, you were seen worldwide on the satellite uh, and uh, it was a it was a big deal, uh, but uh, 
well, I wasn't I wasn't uh, jumping to to get, to get involved with uh, with trying to tap into WTBS's TV. I was just really, really happy with the business that we were doing at that point, 1984, uh, selling out every arena that we went to uh, and uh, about to uh, put together our Continental TV show and uh, and it was about to get even better for us. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, I wish it, I had more involved here. I wish I could give you, um, uh, you know, a bunch of... Uh, a bunch of things that I was thinking and uh, things that I wanted to do. Uh, uh, the the last part though about getting the WTBS TV, I, I believe uh, Ole was a great booker uh, and a great wrestler too. But Ole was a very strong booker, and I believe if you know uh, if, if if that had been my intentions and Ole and I put our heads together as bookers, uh, we could have created on WTBS. Uh, Wow, it's something far beyond, I believe, what uh, Crockett and, uh, and and what McMahon would have been able to do. Uh, but uh, you know, we we were we were uh, not uh, not high profile, I guess is a good way to put it, and that's the way I wanted to keep my business because I'd already had the problem in in 1979. Uh, uh, with uh, with uh, talent and uh, with having a war for a territory, I wanted I didn't want to have any of that happen. I certainly didn't want to go over into Atlanta and create a problem over there uh, and get involved in some type of national problem. Uh, we were doing good. I was happy with that. And uh, uh, that's a great question, though, sir. I really, really appreciate that question. Uh, and I got to say. Uh, as I said uh, at the very, very, very beginning, I don't remember anybody saying that on the TV, but I don't doubt that it could have possibly happened. Uh, I don't think they ever came over. As a matter of fact, if there was somebody that made that announcement. There was a TV station in Atlanta back in those days that uh, was not TBS, it was another station. I can't remember the, the call letters, uh, but I know that they ran a lot of people's shows. They ran uh, different territories. They had the uh, Florida show was on in there. Uh, they had our show on in there. Uh, they had uh, several others. And uh, so it might have been that uh, someone at that station was responsible for running that statement of what was going to happen with, uh, with at this point, we were still Southeastern in 1984. But uh, thank you very much for your question. Great one. Our next question is from Martin Woosley, Brisbane, Australia. Good day, mate. I've been a wrestling fan for more than 50 years and a collector of magazines and programs. I was recently pursuing some from 1973, and there you were. I wouldn't have sent you this question had not I recently discovered your studcast. You were extremely young in those days, but were already competing in main events. I know you had two tours here. The first, a short one. How much do you think your second Australian tour benefited you when you returned to America? Love your stud cast. Jeez, uh, well, thank you very much for that last statement there, Mr. Woosley. Uh, you know, uh, wow. I love to hear from people in Australia. Wow, one of my favorite countries. Jeez. Um, and a good question. Uh, so, yeah, I was there twice. I went to Australia twice. I went in 1971, and I only stayed uh, two weeks. Uh, and I went with my father on that trip because he was interested in getting involved with uh, Jim Barnett, who was the Australian promoter. Uh, Jim uh, and Dad had formed a great relationship. Jim was very... Uh, respectful of my dad and what dad could do and uh, what he had done in his career. So uh, I went over and, and traveled with dad for a couple of weeks in Australia and expected that to be a, a short trip. Uh, then in 1973, January 1973, I was in the Florida Territory um, and uh, 
dad would, had at this point uh, made a deal with Jim Barnett and he, they were partners. They were going to be partners in 1973 in Australia. And uh, so dad came to me and he said, uh, Ron, would you like to go and work in Australia for three months? And uh, I, I really loved the country. The first time we went there in 1971, I was so impressed with the country and the people. And so uh, I, I jumped at the, ch at the chance. Uh, and it was in early 1973. Uh, I had at that point not been a, had only won one championship belt, and it wasn't in the Florida Territory. So, you know, I, I was not a star, yeah, but I was, well, I was pretty high up on the cards. I had made, I had made a push to, to be a pretty hard, pretty, uh, pretty well respected so far as the booking. I was uh, usually in the top two matches or so. And uh, so, so I felt like it, taking the trip to Australia was going to help me significantly uh, because it was going to give me a chance to wrestle against some different wrestlers from different countries, and uh, and it was a uh, and uh, what an opportunity! I mean, uh, wow. Uh, so yeah, so I, I and I didn't stay the whole three months because because uh, Jack Briscoe. Uh, was uh, going to become the NWA World Champion. He was going to take the title from Doy Funk Jr. And uh, something happened. Uh, they were that uh, that uh, Jack ended up uh, having to, to not be able to work into Florida. So I stayed there two months, and then they came to me, Dad and Jim Barnett, and they said, "Ron, uh, we want to send you home." I want to send you back to Florida because Jack is having to leave the territory. And uh, I don't know, it may be, I don't know the exact dates that Jack won the world title in 1973. But uh, they, they sent me home. And uh, so I went home uh, a different wrestler. Uh, well, to be quite honest with you, uh, in a different wrestler in every way. That, that two months in Australia, uh, I was pretty much on top every night. I got to wrestle some great wrestlers. Uh, and before I packed up my stuff to go home, I went and found this guy that made uh, uh, wrestling boots uh, and uh, and out of kangaroo. And uh, wow, I found out that the kangaroo was so much better than leather. Uh, the boots last me forever, practically. And uh, then I, I told him I wanted to do something different, and I put these insets on the sides of my boots. I wanted a white boot, and I wanted to put this light blue color inset on the, on my boots that matched my blue tights that I always wore, and I had a couple of great blue jackets that went with all that. So basically, when I left Australia, I went home as a totally different wrestler, uh, and uh, dressed totally different. Uh, and back in those days, I think that I was the first guy to ever put these color inserts into my boots. And uh, that became overnight a sensation. Uh, and I do remember that I bought a, a uh, kangaroo bag. It was unbelievable. It had crocodile handles on it, and crocodile uh, inlays in it. And it had kangaroo skin on it. Um, yeah, fluffy, beautiful, beautiful bag, beautiful bag. And I remember when I came back to Florida and the first night I went into the dressing room, I had that bag and I set the bag down. And uh, everybody, everybody in the dressing room were like, they covered it up. They just came, what in the, where did you get that from? Wow, wow. They wanted to just touch it. It was like, and then I unzipped that sucker, man, and I took those boots out and I set them down. And every one of those guys went, wow, what in the, man, look at what, they all had the feel of it. It ain't leather, no, it's kangaroo, man. You know, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, so it was like, 
it was like, uh, and then within uh, two weeks, I won my first championship in Florida. I won the Florida Heavyweight Championship. So you asked me what it was like going back home and how much it affected me or changed changed things for me. Uh, I put that those that jackets on I had. I put those new boots on. Uh, I went to the ring. I was, a, and, and I had learned so much. I had learned some moves in Australia that nobody did in America. And, uh, and I, was, I got to be pretty proficient at it. And uh, overnight, uh, and I can't remember who was booking there in that time frame, but uh, wow, it, within two weeks, they, they said, geez, Ron, you, we gotta make you champion. I mean, you, you're not, you, you've, you've gone, you've come back here a wholly different, a different, totally different wrestler. So uh, they put the, the Southern Heavyweight Championship on me uh, first, and then it uh, wasn't long after that I became the Florida Heavyweight Champion. But uh, it changed everything for me. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Woosley, I think it was, uh, uh, it changed my life. It changed everything in my in in my matches, uh, uh, my outfit, uh, my attitude. Uh, I was a totally different wrestler after coming back from Australia on that second tour.